going to the or your earlier question and about whether we will be in the game or not, the fact of the matter is what puts us in the game are trade negotiations, among other things. Um, and the president's authority to implement trade agreements runs out July 1, 2021. And unless the next president is willing to use some political capital to go to the Hill and get an extension of trade promotion authority, the U.S. is going to be out of the game. I would not be stunned to see a second Trump administration or a first Biden administration scrambling to try to get a UK-US deal at least done before April of 2021, when such a deal would have to be at least signed, some form of that deal, to be able to submit it to Congress prior to July 1, 2021. Look, I think what USMCA shows is that trade promotion authority is unnecessary. And frankly, it's a terrible waste of political capital um, provided you have consensus among the leaders, USMCA went through Congress without any of the TPA procedures. It just went through because the Speaker of the House and the Leader of the Senate agreed that they wanted to get it done. And provided you have political consensus, I would invest a lot more in building that consensus than I would in trying to renew trade promotion authority in the first six months of a, of a new administration. I agree with Susan that we need to be engaged. We need to show leadership. We need to be re-engaged. Uh, but I think there are many ways of doing that. And one doesn't have to do a big multilateral WTO round, like the Kennedy round or the Tokyo round or the Uruguay round um, in order to show US leadership. It can be taking building blocks like digital trade, um, it, agreements around e-commerce, around environmental goods, around health care products and things of that sort, and creating agreements around those. And, and again, I think this administration has demonstrated, Trump administration has demonstrated that you can have these sectoral agreements or you can have bilateral agreements that don't necessarily meet WTO standards and get away with it. And so I think pushing that envelope to allow for some non-MFN agreements, some reciprocation based agreements uh, is, it would, be worth, uh, would be worth seriously considering. So the part about violating the WTO, I think, is debatable, but but Mike is correct. That may be something that gets picked up and moved forward. The part about trade promotion authority, I do disagree with because I, I think that had it not been for trade promotion authority, USMCA would not have gone through, period, full stop, because it would have been filibustered, it would have been amended, and it never would have made it. So, you know, we'll never be able to, we'll never be able to, to prove prove it one way or another. Uh, but uh, it is a tool that any administration has to get any form of significant trade agreement through. One of the, I mean, there are a whole variety of issues that are continuing to emerge. Uh, to an interesting degree, politicians, both Republicans and Democrats, in many ways are more hawkish on trade issues and US-China trade issues than the public at large. Uh, and certainly than Democrats. Um, I think the most the most recent Chicago Council uh, survey is fascinating um, and in that regard. And, and I think you find politicians on the left and the right being more hawkish, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. I think companies have been reviewing their supply chains now for several years, um, even before the Trump administration as the costs in China were rising at the pace of 20% a year or so. Uh, then you had the US-China trade tensions, which I think further, further accelerated that review where companies would decide if they didn't move production from China to another country, they would put their, their incremental investment uh, in another country. And then you had COVID. Um, and I think you know, while there might be some reshoring as a result of this, we're likely to see more focus on redundancy, resilience, perhaps regionalization, so closer, shorter supply chains, but not necessarily reshoring all the way. But, uh, but I think companies look at this primarily through the perspective of, of operational risk and what risk they're going through by having an extended supply chain or over dependence on one market for their production of a, of a key input. So I think we accomplish more if uh, we can align ourselves with domestic forces within China that are 
seeking similar results. So um, China's continued to move forward, for example, with the liberalization of financial services because it's in their interest to do so. So we need to find ways of aligning our interests with interests of constituencies in China who still have a voice and can continue to push for those kinds of reforms. So I'm not terribly optimistic in the near term, but I do know that there are market-oriented individuals in China who would like to see more private sector enterprises, to, would like to see more market signals in China. But for the moment, I don't see them, I, I don't see them having any, any control. The notion and the perception that the US doesn't make anything anymore is totally erroneous. Uh, and that in fact, uh, US manufacturing is alive and well and has been alive and well uh, all along. Manufacturing, we make a lot and we make a lot very successfully and we're very innovative, uh, whether it is in, in uh, manufacturing or agriculture or services.